I would like to introduce our guest speaker right now, um, who is me, um, <laughs> except I'm not really a guest. Um, so uh, originally I had an idea for a guest speaker this month. We're still going to end up having that person, but it's going to be the fall. I won't tell you who it is yet, but it's, it's going to be an interesting subject. Um, and so I figured I would pinch it. And as you know, I sent out a note asking for votes on a couple of topics, and we got about 15 responses, which I thought was really good for voting. Uh, and the one I'm going to talk to you about, which is natural radio, won by just a hair. So I haven't forgotten about the other subjects, uh, specifically the M17 mode. That's the other one that got a lot of votes, and um, I will try to do that in the future. It's kind of an interesting subject if you're into uh, digital radio uh, at two meters and 70 centimeters. But for tonight, we're going to talk about something that is, I think, quite interesting. So let me make sure I share my screen. Pardon me to you folks online for just one moment. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to see if this goes full screen. Does that look full screen to everybody? It should. Right. And uh, let me just make sure that you can hear the audio that I'm about to play. Yes. Oh, is it? Uh... Oh, is, I see. Is that... There we go. I seem to be, it, you know what it is? It's this floating, there we go. How's that? Is that better? Online too? Good. Um, by the way, welcome. Pull up a seat. Would you like to introduce yourself? Excellent. Thank you very much, Bob. Sit down. I can go over the announcements later and show you that if you'd like to see them, but you're, you're just in time. So, uh, Jim, just make sure you can hear this. Hold on. Great. Uh, I'll explain what that is in a moment. All right. So here's what we've got for today. We have... The natural radio, and this is in frequency ranges that people don't necessarily listen to because they're not that easy to listen to, but there's some very fascinating stuff that's occurring all the time. We're talking about really low frequencies here, very low frequency and ultra low frequency, and I'll define what that means in a minute. Before I start, I did not come up with this talk all on my own. The material is almost entirely from a very enthusiastic VLF amateur. His name is Jonathan Rizzo. His call is KC3EEY. As we speak, he is preparing to, pre to present some of this material at Hamvention. So you're getting some of what you would have gotten in Xenia. And he's also part of the HamSci Collective. And I contacted Jonathan when I knew that I would cover this subject. And he was very generous to give me the material. So I don't want to take credit for nearly all of it. Jonathan did a very nice job. So what do I mean when I say natural radio? Uh, there are interesting things called whistlers. We'll hear about those in a moment and other things that are generated by processes in the natural environment. There are usually some physics process that's going on like lightning. Lightning happens to have signatures all the way down here. We know li lightning, for example, if you turn it in AM radio, you get a nice burst of static. Whenever you get a lightning going off in the neighborhood, there's a lot of stuff at very low frequencies that's quite interesting that is also associated with the large energy uh, dump that occurs when a lightning stroke happens. There's also some interactions with the ionosphere over our head, which of course we all use to propagate at HF frequencies, for example. Um, and it's more than just kind of static and noise because the only experience that most people have if they have their AM car radio is to hear that kind of crashing noise or maybe even up on 80 meters. Sometimes, you know, if you're listening to 160 meters, there's this annoying crash. There's interesting stuff going on if you examine it more closely. Um, especially from considering where it's coming from. And a lot of those are propagating to you in very interesting ways. And I'll try to talk about a little bit of that. It's not terribly well known on the general public, mainly because they don't sell cars with VLF receivers in them, for example, or you, it's hard to buy the VLF cable radio at the local Walmart. Um, and the most interesting stuff I'm gonna talk about again is VLF and ULF. So I should define that. So if we go to the International Telecommunications Union, the ITU, which is the uh, international body that regulates, every, you know, internationally where frequency allocations are. VLF is three kilohertz to 30 kilohertz. Remember, right, that the, the we have the 2200 meter amateur band, which is at 134 kilohertz. So this is like an order of magnitude below that. 
And then there's ULF, which is 300 hertz to three kilohertz. So that's an even an order of magnitude below that. The interesting thing is that means if you do the math that the wavelength is tens of thousands of meters or longer. So you're not really gonna construct an easy dipole at VLF or ULF. You're gonna need a lot of wire and you're not gonna make the, the whole entire state of Montana, for example, happy should you set, kick everybody out and put your dipole in the state of Montana. So the transmitting antennas are difficult to construct and even for the professional ones, they're horribly inefficient, but you can do communication. And in fact, radio amateurs have in fact communicated with power levels that are surprisingly low. And I'll talk about that. And the interesting thing about VLF and ULF is that the loss per thousand kilometers is not that much. So if you can manage to launch something and get it into the waveguide between the ground and the bottom of the ionosphere at you know, 85, 90 kilometers in the D region, this stuff can, can propagate 10, 100, 10, 100, 100, you know, thousands to 10,000s of kilometers without much power. But again, 99.9% .9 of your transmitter power is wasted because most of the RF coming out of your thing, if you can get out of it, it goes right into the ground and just this ground loss. But there's a little bit of it, if you're skilled, that you can get to launch. And what I just wanted to show you was some numbers about that. This is, I'm, I do policy, I do spectral policy is one of the things also that I keep track of at Haystack. So this is the ITU radio noise curve. This is sort of the official curve, which is way out of date, by the way, and needs to be updated on what the noise level is in a particular band. And what you're seeing here is the bottom is frequency. And if you have really good eyes, you'll see that it's a tenth of a hertz down here. And the top is 10 kilohertz. And this is the y-axis is the effective noise in dB above a resistor at 290 Kelvin room temperature. Okay, and these are 20 dB ticks. So imagine your S meter, right? And you know, normally you'd say S9 and then it's plus 10 dB and plus 20 dB. So if the needle moved 20 dB above S9, it would be one of these ticks. I've colored ULF here in green and I've colored VLF in orange and VLF goes a little bit to the next pulse, the next uh, graph. Um, one thing I forgot to mention here is You'll notice the frequency range. This is in the range of human hearing. Even me, I can still hear up to 10 kilohertz. Um, I, used to be held, I used to be really bugged in the analog TV days by the 15 kilohertz flyback transformer. I could walk in the house and know that the television was on. I can't do that anymore, but I can certainly hear up to 10 kilohertz. I did test it. So the interesting thing about this is that look at the numbers. For ULF, you're talking about 200 to 220 dB of excess noise over this resistor. That's just an arbitrary number, but I'll get back to that in a second. The, the, the dotted curve is the maximum expected value and the, the uh, solid curve is the minimum value. At VLF, it drops down about 40 dB and it's about 180 to 160 dB. Now I'm gonna show you the next chart, which is I've gone up now and now it's 10 kilohertz on the bottom to hundred megahertz. And I got a big arrow where 80 meters is just to give you a reference for you know, bands that we know about. VLF is up here at 160 or 180 and 80 meters, the noise in the background is at its worst about 80 dB lower than these bands. So the, this is the, the, the noise is really screaming. And in fact, if you turn on a receiver often, it sounds like noise because some of this is just atmospheric noise. This is noise being generated by charges flying around in the upper atmosphere. Um, it's actually the lower atmosphere, you know, charged clouds, they generate a lot of noise at these low frequencies. So I'm just telling you that it's a high noise, which also, by the way, works because it means that you don't need a super efficient antenna because the noise is so high, all right? So a very inefficient short antenna can still work. As I mentioned, I'm gonna show you a couple of natural emissions, which you can actually hear. Um, the nice thing, as I mentioned again, is that this is, this is an electromagnetic wave. It is not an acoustic wave. Guess what? The number one question I get at Haystack when we have tours is, can I hear the radio wave? No, an acoustic wave is not an electromagnetic wave, right? So even though the frequency range is something you could hear, you still have to somehow translate the electromagnetic wave into some acoustic signal if you want to hear it but the receiver and transmitter can be pretty simple because you don't need a, you don't need a heterodyne mix from this very high frequency to something you can hear. Some, you can just do a direct conversion and you can literally sometimes just pass it through an audio amplifier and, and uh, listen to it. 
Oh, hear it in your teeth. I haven't heard of that. It's possible, I guess. But if you think about, if you see some of the size of the antennas I'm going to show you, uh, yes, that, that's a really, really inefficient antenna. Although, as Bill is referring to, you know, your fillings are a diode. And that's why, you know, if you're in the near field of a 50 kilowatt AM transmitter, sometimes you can hear the modulation and listen to the music without having anything. I grew up about seven miles from WGY, which is the uh, clear channel station that General Electric put together in 1922. And the backyard fence would sometimes read the news to me. So it's interesting. But no, I haven't heard about that at these, these springs. Now, the trouble is the center frequency is really, really low. So the fractional bandwidth, which is the part that you get to use to communicate, is also really, really small. So the information transfer is reasonably slow here. Slow speed CW, slow speed is really slow, or coherent phase coding. And we'll, we'll hear about that in a moment. So then science as usual and, and avid amateurs name this all this stuff, kind of interesting name. So we're gonna go through a couple of these, just as to start with the natural emissions you can hear in these bands. And I'll go over each one of these. So these things called spherics, which is a contraction for atmospherics. This is really the most common type of thing. If you have a VLF receiver that's kind of from three to 30 kilohertz or in that range, and you turn on your system, this is generated by lightning discharges. Every time lightning goes off, it's a broadband noise source. And it's really broadband because you know it all goes all the way up to a few hundred meters because you can hear it on your AM radio. It basically goes DC all the way up if you're close enough to it. But most of the power is down in the VLF band. And they occur constantly, right? The lightning is going off somewhere on the planet all the time. And um, you can even figure out what direction they're coming from by using time of group arrival. You basically have multiple stations. You can look at the delay from one station to another one, and you can figure out the bearing of where this thing is coming from. And I mentioned this Earth ionosphere waveguide, right? Between the ground and the bottom of the ionosphere, maybe about 90 kilometers, you can think of that as a waveguide and think about it going around the planet. There are these resonant peaks all the way down at like eight hertz, 16 hertz. They're called Schumann resonances. And they're actually used for monitoring global lightning detection. You don't, you just put up an antenna. And if you can make sure that it resonates at that very low frequency, you can just count lightning flashes, even though they're going off in Africa or Europe or anywhere else. You don't need to be near the lightning flash. And that's how people monitor global lightning discharges, actually. So what's a spheric look like? Well, or it sound like. Hard a little scene in the, in the, in the in, but I'm gonna show you this. This is a spectrogram. So on the left-hand axis is frequency from DC to about 20 kilohertz. So, you know, VLF is in the middle of this. And this is time in milliseconds for, uh, of, this is one second from one side to the other. And these stripey things you see are impulsive bursts that are these spherics that are being generated by lightning. And so I'm gonna play you a little recording. Ah. Jonathan tells me this is what you get like whenever you turn on the receiver. You just get these little pops. And there's not too much you can tell except for you can count the clicks and you can figure out lightning rates. And like I said, you may also be able to de determine where they're coming from. Some of them are called tweaks. I like these names. Um, some of them don't just sound like a, an impulsive pop. There's a little bit of a frequency component. There's a little bit of delay between the higher frequency and the lower frequencies. These are not whistlers. These are called tweaks. Tweak atmospherics, typically due to this waveguide and the, you know, the lower atmosphere there, they tend to occur about 1.7 kilohertz. You probably know 440 on your piano is middle C. So this is like in the octaves above middle C. And they also occur at harmonics above that, you know, 3.4, 6.8, and they get labeled by mode. Um, this frequency- 440, 440 is A above middle C. Uh, correct. Thank you, George. I should have known that. Um, it's the voice of reason. Um, so the other thing is that the, the frequency dispersion, which means the delay between the high frequency and low frequency components is really fast. It's only a few milliseconds. And, but you can, but I'm going to, what I'm going to play you, 
see if you can distinguish the pops, which are the spherics, from these things that have a little bit of a frequency tone on them. Those are the tweaks. And again, starting at 1.7 kilohertz, listen. Uh, oh, I'll get to it. By the way, they're taking much longer propagation paths than the spherics. So they're going farther, and that means there's more of a chance for the high frequencies to go a little faster and get to you first before the lower frequencies. They're often observed at night, similar to when you know AM broadcast stations go farther at night because the D region goes away and there's a different propagation paths. It turns out that when that the bottom of the ionosphere moves up, weeks have a little longer path and they tend to be a little more frequent. You can calculate the reflection height if you make very careful delay measurements. And what you're going to hear is you have to listen for the, the he calls it a pinging sound. Think about somebody like you know kind of pinging a metal fence. So I think you can hear it in this. This is, this is one of the spectrograms, and you can see that little curved part right down here. It's not just a straight up and down line. That's a spheric. Listen. A little hard to hear on the speaker, probably because I've got not enough high frequency here. Hang on. Let's see if I can change that. Let me try that again. There's a little bit of a little bit of almost like a spring going off. There's a little bit of a twang to them. They're not quite a pop. So those are those are tweaks. And the interesting thing is that sometimes if you look on these spectrograms, like the top part here has two harmonics. You can see the the fundamental, and then the arrow is pointing to the second harmonic at 3.4. Here's one with three. Here's one with four. Here's one with eight harmonics going all the way up. And here's, an, here's another one where you have multiple of these tweaks. So if you, it's hard to hear that, of course, but if you sat down and you analyzed it with, say, a fast Fourier transform, which is what you're doing in this waterfall, you can see these particular coherent harmonic structures. So those are the tweaks. They're, they're again, maybe the next most common type. And then there's whistlers. Whistlers are a very famous kind of uh, VLF. Uh, they're, they, they were just... Uh, Whistlers showed up in World War I. In World War I, the people in Europe laid out very long telegraph lines and trenches, which were a giant antenna. They went for kilometers and kilometers. They were a pretty good antenna for receiving these. They put on their headphones to listen to some of the telegraph traffic, and they're, they're hearing what I'm going to play for you in a moment. The allies think that the Axis is doing it. The Axis thinks the allies are doing it. They thought that each, each was jamming the other one until they figured out that, no, no, everybody's hearing the same thing. These are waves that start out as lightning bursts, right? Those pops, those, those spherics. And, they prop, and the signal doesn't just stay going from horizontally. It propagates out all the way to, to three or four Earth radii, about 12,000 kilometers out to the magnetic equator and back to the other hemisphere where you hear them. When they, and, and in fact, they propagate in little sort of density ducts. That's a place where the electron density that's, that's orbiting with us in the planet is a little bit lower than that. And that kind of traps the wave along the magnetic field. I mentioned this dispersion where the higher frequency components get there before the lower frequencies. This is going to be an extreme form of that. And that's why they're whistlers. If you've never heard them, you're going to figure this out in a minute. Um, and so remember, this is going all the way from across the hemisphere to the opposite hemisphere. So they start in the northern hemisphere, and you, for example, if you go to Antarctica, you can hear them in the southern hemisphere. People at Stanford University used these beginning in the 1950s and 60s, before we had nice orbiting satellites with probes on them, to actually figure out what the electron density profile is here. They, were, they are, in fact, today are still used as a fundamental tool to probe that region of narrow space without having to go out in it. Um, the rate that the tone drops tells you the number of electrons along the path from where the lightning was to where you are. And you can back that out. And, and then if you figure that one out and another one that comes on a next little duct, you can work out what the density profile looks like. There's a couple of different kinds. Most of them are monochromatic. It's one note that descends. There are some that have a range of frequencies that almost look like, sound like a hissing noise that drops. So here's an example of a whistler, very clear right on the spectrogram. The high frequency showed up first, and then the lower frequency showed up last. So you get these curves. And I, like I said, that example, that curved example is the reason that we, we, that's something you can pull out to tell what's going on 
quite far away from the planet. Now I'm going to Here's another one. That's got that's got a little more hits in it, right? Little little more little more a few frequencies. Now occasionally you get like a multiple of these going off at once, which is a little bit like there's there's a couple that almost are starting when the last one ends. You can still hear the pops, right? Those are the spherics going off. And then you get these whistlers. Yeah. Now think about that. You're sitting there in 1917 and you're in the trench and you put on your, you know, your high impedance headphones and you hear that. What are you gonna think? You know, the, the 18 year old has been given a rifle and told to stand in the trench is probably now quivering in the corner like the aliens are here or something. I don't know what I'm hearing. Um, it's they're they're just amazing. Oh, uh, those are typically uh, they typically terminate at about a kilohertz, so they're up about a few kilohertz, um, up to like this frequency axis terminates at about fifteen kilohertz. So they're you know they they start fairly high and then they come down. And these are for typical whistlers that are for for um, whistlers occur on other planets. By the way, I'm just showing you ones on Earth. There there are people who have recorded these on other planets with magnetic fields, but. These are the ones that are terrestrial. Okay, come on. This is what one of the Stanford stations down at Palmer. Palmer is on the, uh, what used to be called the Palmer Peninsula, sticking up out of Antarctica, which is the only thing that's pointed towards South America and us. A very nice whistler right there. The scale is power in dB. So you can see that some of these are pretty strong. Um, and again, the frequency axis, there's two kilohertz, six kilohertz, eight kilohertz. So, you know, in the mid few kilohertz range. As I mentioned, they're propagating. So the end point of where the lightning stroke started one is located in the opposite hemisphere, okay? And that's what we call the conjugate point. And every point on the earth, if you know the model of the magnetic field, you can connect it to the other end of the field line, okay? You, you, if you know the background magnetic field and there are models for that, people have worked that out. So the interesting thing is you can make maps of where the conjugate point is. This is a map and this is, this is pretty out of date. This is from the year 2000. Uh, we have moved away from the magnetic pole because the magnetic pole is racing away from us. In 50 years, the magnetic pole will be in Siberia. It will not be anymore in the Americas. It's moving very fast because the Earth's core is beginning to change its magnetic orientation. But in the year 2000, here we are in Massachusetts where my little cursor is. And if you trace that, you know, magnetically, that's really down here. It's near Terra del Fuego. And in fact, it's now in the ocean off the co coast of South America between there and this Antarctic Peninsula sticking up. So that's our conjugate point. So if I'm hearing a whistler here, it's actually coming from all the way down there, some kind of lightning going off in that particular area. Those of you who read, merit, read about maritime stuff know that that part of the world has one of some of the worst seas in the entire world. You know, lightning going off there, really terrible storms. So it makes sense that we could hear whistlers here because there's stuff being generated at the other end. You'll also notice, by the way, at this map, it's easy to figure out where the, the magnetic pole is because in the Americas where we are, the offset between the geographic pole and the geomagnetic pole is the most. If I go over here to Africa, for example, the magnetic equator, which is this dashed line, is not that far from the geographic equator. So that's kind of interesting. In our, in our latitudes, you know, the geographic equator and the magnetic equator are separated by about 10, 11 degrees, which is why when you have a compass, you have to figure those things out. Now, I that was a, uh, the, one of the thing I talked about was a whistler that started in one hemisphere and ended up with you. It doesn't have to happen. Sometimes there's a reflection where you are and it ends up going back for another hop. It's going to get dispersed yet again. So now the, 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 the high frequencies are gonna get there even sooner than the lower frequencies. So the delay between frequencies is gonna get longer and longer. And that curve is gonna smooth itself out more and more every time it takes a hop. 
So Whistler echoes are watching these whistlers come back at you with correspondingly larger delays, and then it can reflect from the other end. This is, this is like having a waveguide where you don't have a match at the end, and so you get energy reflecting back and forth. And some of these ducks are low enough loss that they go back and forth 100 times. I don't have that example, but I wish I had the recording of that. Eventually, the wave loses enough energy that it just blends into that background noise that I played at the first, for the first recording with the pops. So there's some, right? See, there's the first whistler. And then notice the second one has got a shallower slope and then shallower and shallower and shallower. And shallower. This is the thing bouncing back and forth, back and forth. And here's one. Slower, right? Really slow. So that's hop three. Hop four. Hop five. And so the people at Stanford would use these to figure out, in, again, more interesting things about the electron density along these things. This is, whistlers are an absolutely fundamental tool for doing this kind of stuff. It's getting slower because it starts out life as an impulse. All the frequencies happen at the same time. It goes through one hop and now it's, the, the frequencies are spread. But then you take that copy and then increase the delay between the, the high and low further every time it takes a trip. So if the, the tone takes this long to drop, then the tone takes longer and then longer every time it goes again through another bounce because the medium is dispersive, meaning it doesn't transmit all the frequency components at the same rate. Because there's, there's, there's charged particles in between you and when it takes its trip and it, the wave interacts with the charged particles. Um, I'm not going to talk about multi hops too much. Um, whistlers can, you know, this, what I played you was really only one primary duct. Sometimes there's a bunch of little ducts that are sort of aligned. So you can hear whistlers coming on slightly different paths to you with slightly different delays. And for some, and if you listen to these in headphones, Sometimes you can hear that the frequency is a little bit broad. It's very hard to tell on the speaker. But um, this is another thing that you can look at the, the structure of the electrons along the magnetic field by looking at how broad that is. Then there's another thing called chorus. This is another piece of physical phenomena that doesn't have to do with the electrons that are along this magnetic field line. This has to do with energetic particles like high energy electrons that are orbiting our planet. You probably know about the inner and outer radiation belts, right? Van Allen discovered these in about 1958 when he launched Explorer 1. Um, and for a couple of days panicked because he thought he had discovered a radiation source so intense that no one would ever be able to fly in space without being killed when they, when they went through it. Turns out they figured out if you went a certain direction, your dose was reduced. In any case, there's a lot of energy in these particles. They want to give it up. And one of the things they will do is give it up to waves that are in the same frequency range that I was just playing with, VLF. And the shape of those waves tend to tell you quite a bit about the energy of the electrons and the other particles that are surrounding these particular regions. So again, you can back out some information without having to fly a satellite through them about that particular area. And it turns out that now we fly satellites through with very sensitive wave detectors. And we actually record them in, in place. And I'll show you that in a minute, but you can actually hear them at the bottom. The reason they're called chorus is imagine that if you've gotten up at dawn and the birds are beginning to chirp because the temperature is coming up and the sun is rising, um, there, there are these little rising tones and they sound like little chirps and they most times overlap. These waves are not generated in isolation. Here's a bunch of them from Stanford. It's these little rising tones, these little things down here that are kind of going up in frequency as a function of time. This is a, th these up here are another thing, but you wanna concentrate on this stuff. And they're about two kilohertz, again, well within range of hearing. Here's an example. this is that we're recording from the ground. So all the lightning strokes are in there, all the spherics, maybe there's a whistler in there, which is competing with them, right? Well, it turns out that if you fly a wave detector in space, this is NASA's Van Allen probes. 
um, which I was involved with uh, professionally. And there was a wave instrument with a bunch of electric and magnetic field antennas on them. And this is what they sound like in space. So this is what a chorus element sounds like before it's propagating down to the atmosphere. So I guess I've got to click this. Oops. Hang on a second. There we go. Much cleaner. Now you can hear now you can understand why they call it chorus. It does. If you've ever been to Puerto Rico, they have these little tree frogs called coquis. They sound a lot like this. I, this these are some of the best recordings that have ever been made of chorus because they flew a 14-bit an analog to digital converter on the satellite and they just recorded them. Um, the interesting thing about them is that um, they, uh, let me see, now how do I get back here? Probably. Oh no. Okay, hold on a second. There we go. Go back into this mode. There. So um, again, the shape of them, how intense they are, tells you a lot about the interactions between the waves and the particles and tells you something about the particle energy out there, which tells you something about the radiation belts. So even receiving these on the ground, you can figure out something about the particles out at four Earth radii, 24,000 kilometers that way. It's very interesting stuff. Sometimes a VLF event comes in and triggers another one. So you get one tone and then something else happens. And the, you can do that in the spheric, you can do that with a whistler, you can do that with a chorus event. And they usually are rapidly rising tones. So notice there's some whistlers, right? And then you see these stripes going up. That's what you're going to hear as a rapidly rising tone that was triggered by the whistler showing up. Hear that? That was a triggered emission. That was not in the original, the first place. It was triggered by the, the chorus element showing up, which I think is interesting. There. Okay. And then there's hiss. Closer into Earth, there is this stuff that sounds like just background noise. It's thermal noise. It's not background noise. It's actually things randomly interacting with one another. Um, but you would think that it's just increased re uh, receiver noise. It's not really. Um, it tells you something different about a different region. And I don't have one to play from you from the ground, but I have one to play you from a, an, a satellite. This is what they, this is what, notice that these, Remember these Whistler trains? Notice that on the right-hand side, they're, they're fading to this sort of broadband fuzz. That's hiss. Now, I don't have an audio from that from the ground, but what I do have, this is NASA's polar satellite, and they were flying. You know, this circle is two or three Earth radii, and inside the more dense regions of the ionosphere and the overlying what we call plasma sphere that surrounds the planet and rotates with it, you find this hiss, and so I'm about to play that for you. And you're going to hear this pulsing sort of noise. That kind of sounds like a across bottle, right? By the way, the fact that it's pulsing is because the spacecraft is rotating. It's rotating with about a 10 second period. So the antenna is lining up with the hiss and then not lining up with the hiss. And and so the hiss is always there and it's random and it's pretty much in any direction. It's just that the sensor is rotating. Yeah. That's a good question. When people have looked with finer and finer frequency scale, there's a- Can you repeat the question, please? Uh, the question was, is it stochastic or random? Which is a good question for statistical people. Um, there, there are people that argue that this is totally unstructured. Okay, it, it is, you know, it's a Gaussian random process. However, there are people who have analyzed it and, and claim that there are tiny little coherent bursts buried in, the, in what looks incoherent. That's probably the case if you look at, at fine enough scales. That's actually an open question now as to whether his truly is completely random phase. Everything is just uncorrelated to one another. We don't know yet. So that was all the natural stuff. Now I'm gonna just spend a, the, the last bit here talking about man-made stuff. Turns out that the humans have been using VLF and even ELF 
since again, about World War I, you know, within the first 20 years of when radio showed up because somebody figured out that VLF penetrates seawater very well. ELF, is, which is 300 Hertz to three kilohertz will get you to the bottom of the Marianas Trench with no problem. It goes right through seawater. So um, people who ran things like submerged vessels figured out that if they wanted a one-way communication device from the ground to the thing that was submerged that they could use these frequency ranges. If they could get a, an antenna system that was powerful enough to generate enough energy to go down through there. So most of the navies of the world began doing that. Uh, Germany, Soviet Union, uh, later Russia, US has been doing it for a long time. And so we'll talk a little bit about some of that. It's really hard to see in the spectrogram, but you'll see that some of these coherent tones in here, which are flat with frequency over time, that's RSDN, that's the Russian Alpha Navigation System. The order of the tones is a coded message. And so there's a code book somewhere that the, you, you would just hear these tones that would sort of change frequency, kind of like frequency shift keying. Then there's the VLF system. This is NAA, the very famous station up in Cutler, Maine. Those are the antennas at 24 kilohertz. That is not a typo, two megawatts input power, CW, not pulsed. And they're dumping 99% of that energy into the ground. But 1% of it gets out and goes through the oceans. That's called an umbrella array. What you're seeing on the, on the picture is the, tow is the towers and the antennas are hung in curtains between the towers. Um, look at the tower size. The central tower is 304 meters. That's about 900 feet up. And there are masts around them that are slightly shorter in about a half a kilometer radius. And then there are six more towers not in the picture that are out from that. They're a little shorter. And so then you hang these curtain antennas in between the towers. And that is an attempt to get an antenna that's large enough that at least you increase the efficiency a little bit. Um, but again, remember, what are the wavelengths? 20,000 kilometers or more. Hard to get an antenna 20,000 kilometers long. So even this is not that efficient, but it's a lot better than what I would do in my backyard. Yeah, Bill. I would, I, so, so Bill is mentioning that W1IG, right? K1IG is apparently a former naval officer and has a nice presentation on these, this particular system. It would be very interesting to hear that sometime here. Um, this is an amazing system. Now it's Maine, by the way, and Maine has ice. This has a three megawatt de-icing system. They pump 60 Hertz through it at three megawatts, which I find entertaining because it's larger than the transmitter power. And they basically just melt the ice off. And they have, two, they have two antenna arrays and they have two de-icing systems. The de-ice array A, well, they're using array B because these can never go offline. They are operational. Now, one of the things I wanna, one of the things I wanna tell you, and I, I, can't, I don't wanna do it here to mess up the audio, but if you use, there's a web SDR in the University of Twente in Netherlands. You can put webSDR.org. The first thing you'll come through is a system that goes nearly DC to 30 megahertz. And I tried this before I came over here. You can put in Cutler, Maine. This is a system in Europe to 24 kilohertz and you will hear phase coded tones. And that is this system transmitting and it's going tens of thousands of kilometers and it full quiets the receiver. It's, so if you pump this much power in, you can make sure that everybody receives these. And you'll hear it's just, it's frequency shift keying. And I don't know what they're transmitting. Yes, that, that, is, that is the US Navy. It's one way because you don't want to make the submarine drag an antenna ray out like that in the middle, in the you know, underwater. Um, so typically the messages, as I understand it, go in. And then if they have to get a message back, they'll pop up somewhere and send a burst up to a satellite and then you know, go back under. So they don't, they don't transmit back at VLF. It's kind of like a, kind of like a one way. You know, number 56, you have a message. So, and a study that I actually worked on, remember that Van Allen probes that I mentioned that there was an antenna array on that? I, I played chorus for you. I don't have the audio, but this is a spectrogram. Now this is from 10 kilohertz up to about hundred kilohertz, okay? And this is a function of earth radii. One would be the surface of the earth. 
So we're out here at two and a half to three Earth radii. So we're about 12 to 15,000 kilometers. You see those flat lines? Those are the VLF transmitters propagating all the way out along the field lines into near Earth space. And the reason, and the bottom, the bottom plot is the intensity of that wave. That's the NAA transmitter that I showed you in Cutler, Maine as a function of distance, that's five orders of magnitude above the background. So we have been since the 1920s creating what we call a VLF bubble, a bubble of communications that goes out to a certain radius. I, there's some physics that explains why that is, which I won't go into here. These frequency ranges are highly resonant with the relativistic electrons, like the, the MeV electrons in the radiation belt. So humans have been fundamentally altering the shape of the radiation belt for about a century. And one of my colleagues said, it would be interesting to see what would happen if you get all the navies to turn off their VLF transmitters for three days and see what happens. He hasn't made that happen. yet. But the electrons are circling around the field lines and it turns out that these waves have a electric field which circulates around at just the same rate that the electrons at that energy are rotating. So the electrons, it's like having somebody constantly pushing on them and they get accelerated. So this is actually something that's shaping the radiation belts. So we have, humans have an interesting impact, even out to distances you'd never thought were possible at these frequency ranges. And this is kind of the way the schematic goes, you know. You have this VLF, you have this VLF transmissions, and then you have these, what we call killer electrons. These are things that mega electron volts, they're relativistic. If they go, spacecraft die when they're bathed in these because the electronics basically gets ionized and stops working. So people try to come, people try to keep satellites inside these belts. There's a slot in between the inner and the outer belt. And then a lot of satellites tend to be, try to be parked in there. However, if the belt moves inward, well, maybe then the satellite ends up getting bathed in this stuff and it doesn't like it. So that there are a lot of people who study this stuff. In any case, there's, you can think of this bubble of VLF energy that's surrounding the planet. And then I wanna mention one other human VLF transmission. This is the Alexanderson alternator at a station called SAQ. Anybody's heard of this? This is in, uh, in Sweden. It's the only, VLF radio station in operation today. Until the 1920s, there were a lot of VLF radio stations because this is the way Marconi and RCA did commercial Morse traffic, wireless traffic. And then eventually they went to higher frequencies. Um, this transmits at 17.2 kilohertz CW. And the way that it does it is an alternator, a mechanical alternator, which is rotating at a high enough speed that it generates a 17 kilohertz on off signal. And this guy named Ernst F, uh, you know, um, this guy named Ernst F. W. Alexanderson, who worked for General Electric, and invented a whole bunch of things. Invented the alternator because of this guy Fessenden in 1904, who said, "I'd like one of these because I'd like to be able to design a radio transmitter that will go at these frequencies because I know it goes long distances." They already knew that these things would transmit long distances if you can only get the power out. And this is also hooked to six antenna towers with 1.2 kilometer long, 1.9 kilometer long radiation elements, radiating elements, wires there. I mean, and the whole thing is a world heritage site. So if you've ever visited Sweden, apparently you can go there and they, they do transmissions twice a year. One of them on Christmas Eve and the other one typically sometime around the 4th of July. Um, and this is, what the trans, this is what the alternator looks like. And this is some of the transmission towers. These are Marconi T's and what I want to show you here. Well, this is them activating the transmitter. Hop around and see what You're bringing it up to speed. It's about 15 minutes. So now it's
here are the contactors. My Morse is not good enough to determine what this is. And so they do this for like 10 minutes. Then they power the whole thing down and they do it six months later. It's kind of out of control. Um, I, this is the problem with these things is that imagine the mechanical maintenance that has to go on on something that is rotating fast enough to generate a 17 kilohertz signal. I don't want to be anywhere near that thing um, in case it decides to, what, what's the, the word, spontaneously disassemble itself. Um, this is why they went to higher frequencies so they didn't have to use alternators, for example, to generate this current. They could use electronics eventually. But um, if you look for announcements, the AWR will use as an announcement that SAQ is going to do their transmission. They now live stream this on YouTube. So you can actually tune in for about 45 minutes. You can watch them spin up the system. You can watch them tuning the final. And then you can watch this guy who sits down with his green eye shade and he has his copy and he sits down and starts transmitting this. And the la I actually watched these one of these and on a screen, I had the web SDR from the Netherlands and I could hear him coming through in the web SDR a little, a little later from him sending the copy. And then, then they show you what the copy is later for those people like me who are not so good at copying CW yet. Um, it's, it's just fabulous. I, it was about 15. So it was very sedate. Okay, it wasn't like 40 words per minute or something. Okay, what do you, so I'm gonna end with, what do you do to receive this stuff or even maybe transmit it? And if you're not, you know, NAA and Cutler, Maine. Um, like I said, this stuff can be pretty simple. Really, you have your inefficient antenna, you hook it up to a JFET, right? Or you could do that with a triode, right? Or some kind of vacuum tube, something that's a voltage, got a high impedance in. You get some gain out of it, you filter it to knock out some of the uh, higher frequency stuff that you don't want, and then you throw it into a headphone driver. That's it. So um, this is typically, this is, this is, for example, one, and it's labeled E field because the antenna is most sensitive to the electric field in this case. Um, but you can see it's not too big. And this is, this is the schematic. I mean, it, you know, except for some biasing, it's a FET input. And then you come off that and there's a little bit of filtering here. And you know, there's a not so sophisticated 2N3904 jelly bean part NPN transistor and out to the microphone and or your headphones. That's pretty much it. Not very sophisticated. Uh, here's another one. Again, you'll recognize the MPF102. That's a JFET right there. And, uh, and some Zener diodes to protect against transients coming in from the antenna. But it, it, it's an you know, Radio Shack audio transformer. Remember Radio Shack? Um, so it's, it's not too bad. Um, and this is what they look like. So, you know, they fit in a little box, a little uh, bud box, not too big, with a nine volt battery powering the JFET and the audio amp. Uh, not, not very much. NASA put a kit together called Inspire, um, and they have a little network. I'm not even sure Inspire is still accepting people. This was a few years ago, but again, you can see that the, the uh, receiver is not too bad. Um, you can also make magnetic field receivers, which, which basically go for loops. And the loops, in fact, you can have two loops orthogonal to one another if you'd like to do angle of arrival, because one will be the north-south plane and one will be the east-west plane. And if you compare the phases of the two, you can do a little bit of uh, beam detection. But again, you can need an audio transformer because this is, you need, you need an inductive transformer in front of the fact, because you've got current flowing now, um, rather than doing, your, you're doing voltage sensing. And filter it out to a headphone. And this is what a B field receiver looks like. You'll notice the, you know, the uh, coupled transformer in the front and the rest of it is a bunch of op amps. Not very hard. This is what some of them look like in the field. Um, this is a person over in Norway, I believe, who would put one out, you know, by a lake. And so there's the antenna, multiple wraps of wire there as a loop. This is another loop receiver. Somebody out in, away from things. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Uh, trying to listen for VLF signals. 
And so this is what Jonathan says. What are you going to hear if you put this together? Nothing exciting. I think he's trying to manage expectations. You can hear a lot of spherics, pops. You can hear some, some of these tweaks that have a little bit of a tone. And you're going to hear tons of power line hum, which is why people go where there's not power lines, because power lines have harmonics of 60 hertz. And 300 hertz, you're only at the fifth harmonic of the power line. And so we're blessed with a lot of power lines in New England. So it's a little harder to hear this stuff. Um, you have to sometimes have notch filters to filter that stuff out. Um, sometimes you'll hear the like the Russian alpha navigation tones. If he says, if you're really lucky, you'll hear a whistler. I don't have experience with how rare that is. Um, I've just heard good examples, so I know it does happen. Um, and it's apparently quite an event if you're listening on headphones and a whistler comes in. Um, he says, be at least five miles away from power lines. So if you like to camp, take your VLF receiver with you. Um, underground power lines is a little better. Um, and you know, get a good digital audio recorder. You don't have to use cassette tapes anymore to record this stuff. Um, and so there's Jonathan on the left kind of, uh, I think he was at a convention trying to see what he could hear. And then here's a person in a more typical spot trying to do VLF reception. Power line hum is the big one. Um, power line hum can be detected in Antarctica. Now there's nobody, not a lot of people living in Antarctica, but remember I told you about that conjugate field line business? The power line hum basically propagates all the way along the field line from the Northern hemisphere. So you can't escape it. It's everywhere. My colleague, Lou Lanzarotti at Bell Laboratories um, has found it in the magnetosphere from spacecraft. You can actually find coherent power line hum, three earth radii out in the wave data. It's quite unmistakable. You can't miss it. So again, one of the things we're also sending out into space. Um, motors, uh, switching power supplies, which are switching at a rate that generates tons of harmonics straight into this band that's not so hot. Um, and he mentions that you can, you know, you think, oh, well, it's conducted noise. I can filter it out on the power lines, right? Except for the problem is that the, the frequency, for example, of a switching converter changes when you load it more. And so the frequency is wobbling around for some of this stuff. And, you know, you're trying to track a moving target. That can be a little challenging. But people like Jonathan have done a reasonable. And he mentions that, you know, people used to use audio tape recorders. And I was mentioning to John before we started, you know, audio tape recorders, of course, fluttered, right? And so the tone would go, and you had to try to correct for your recording problems. That's not so bad today because you can get digital audio recorders fairly cheaply, and you can run them at 192 kilohertz. So the Nyquist frequency says you've got everything up to 100 kilohertz. And if you have the right coupling transformer in, they're pretty good. So this is the stuff that you get to deal with. You get to also deal with autos driving on the street with ignition systems. Um, AM broadcast, if you're near a clear channel 50 kilowatt station, there's intermod all over the place, sometimes from rusted bolts on the joints on the antenna. And that also generates VLF noise. Um, even the VLF antenna itself microphonics, if it physically gets pushed by wind or if you happen, something happens to hit it like a stone, you'll hear that ringing in the antenna. And also, poor counterpoise grounds, right? Anybody who's deployed a vertical antenna knows that you got to have a good ground radial field. For these frequencies, it's even more important. And so if you don't have a really good counterpoise, you know, your efficiency suffers and you can have some trouble. So is any of this possible at home? Well, again, power line hum is the first roadblock. If it's reasonably stable, you can pull it out in software. Um, but you can't overload the front stage of the receiver because if you do, if the analog preamps get overloaded, it doesn't matter the sampler is gonna get basically clipped IMD and harmonics. So you have to make sure that you attenuate the input enough to not lose the signal, but not clip the, clip the sampler. So you have to fiddle with that some. Many people run these powered by batteries so that there is no switching power supply, at least local to the device. Um, that's a little hard to do if your VLF receiver is out in a trench and you want to power it from, say, a building. Um, so that's something that you have to work on. I won't go through this, some of these other things here. Uh, these are just things that are, would be natural to a system that you want to take data all the time. This is an example installation. So this is my friend Nathaniel's house, W2NAF. He lives, uh, he's a professor at the University of Scranton in Pennsylvania. So this is in the Scranton, PA area. And that's his house on the left-hand side there. Um, in the back, 
and the line is the trench they were installing for the cabling that was going out to the VLF antenna, which Jonathan here in the red jacket is standing by. And you see how far away they were getting it from the house. It turned out that they discovered that that wasn't even good enough because one of the ground wires that was going through this conduit was not broken up sufficiently and it was a giant antenna. And so the ground was basically floating up and picking up every piece of noise in his house and injecting it into the front end of the antenna. So he had to fix that. But now that he's fixed it, it's, it's a pretty clean system. Um, but you can see that, you know, if you really want a sensitive thing, you do have to kind of get it out away from the stuff in the house. This is an example of an active antenna. You know, as you know, if you have a really short antenna, you put a preamp right up at the front and that raises the signal to the point where you can deal with a smaller antenna than you would have otherwise. And so, you know, there's a screwdriver for length and it's a bunch of preamps and, and, and conditioning capacitors and resistors. And, you know, so you can see the construction that's in fact foam pipe wrap. So it's, you know, and, and uh, gold tape. So again, there are plans online for making these out of reasonably uh, low cost. And it's, by the way, it's all through hole, no SMD in case anybody didn't like. And it's often run with a Raspberry Pi. I guess Raspberry Pi's are very hard to get right now, like everything, but when they become available, throw a Raspberry Pi in an enclosure and hook it up and that's your sampler. Um, this is an example and I'm almost done here. This is an example of some of the data that Jonathan and Nathaniel have collected with their system. Now, um, one of the things that you see here is uh, there's actually in the middle of this, one of these spikes is a GPS locked beacon that someone is running at a little under nine kilohertz. Um, it's, it's a little hard to see there, but it, it turns out it's there. This was, this was them receiving the trans Christmas Eve trans transmission just this past December 24th. And so this is 17.2. And so there are the sidebands of the CW signal being transmitted. And over here, I'm not gonna explain what an SID is. That's basically a sudden change in phase. It has to do with ionospheric, I mean, propagation of the waveguide. But you see all these big square waves down here, clunk, 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 clunk. That's NAA. And so there's the bits. There's a zero, there's a one. So there, there's, your, there's your frequency shift keying. So in a pretty small system, it comes through quite clearly. And again, if you go to Web's FCR and you listen to it, it's like unmistakable, it's really loud. So what about transmitting? So the final frontier is to be able to transmit, but you know, you've, you've all, now you've gotten sort of depressed by looking at the size of NAA, right? And the two megawatt transmitter and the football field or more. The long wavelength means that anything is gonna be small radiated powers, all right? A small antenna puts five to 20 microwatts out ERP. If you have a large installation, it's a few hundred microwatts. And if you put a kite up in the air and you run a, 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 a copper line to the kite, you can get a few milliwatts. So you have a nice big vertical antenna. But the nice thing is that the cavity between the ground and the answer is a fairly efficient waveguide. So you don't, if you can inject something into the waveguide, you don't lose too much energy if it's propagating away, like a few dB per thousand kilometers. So you can actually get something to the other continent pretty. And the nice thing is the paths tend to be stable and repeatable. There isn't very much fading, unlike the short wave frequencies we all deal with. And so you can get a steady phase signal for minutes to hours at a time. And so there's a bunch of signal processing you can do on that that you can't do on your 80 meter signal, which is fading every few seconds and doing other things. So that's actually nice. That helps your detection. So this, uh, Jonathan's giving a talk at, at the Tapper conference, which occurs in the fall, 2022. He's implemented something that is below nine kilohertz, but is amateur communications. Something called the dreamers band. I had not heard about this until I talked to Jonathan. Um, you're licensed to transmit below nine kilohertz, have at it, no problem. Um, but you need coding. You need a, just like WSJT, you need a lot of coding gain where you put a signal in there that is deterministic that you can pick out of the noise there. And you need a very long code to pile up enough energy that you can detect it, okay? And so it's called EB naught. The EB is, for anybody that knows communications theory, EB over N0 is the fundamental 
and you know the the, the fundamental uh, unit of uh, information in the channel. This is back to Claude Shannon, and so EB naught is this digital mode that is designed for these VLF links. And so you can there's a web page that I've got in the slide that you can fill out. It's close to one dB of the theoretical information limit that you can jam into this channel. So it's this is amateur stuff, but it's really close. And the plot on the right is W4DEX all the way to Italy, 8,822 uh, 22 kilometers, uh, 8.822 kilohertz. So that's just below nine kilohertz, 7173 kilometers. That's 150 microwatts. And that's after you decode the code. You take all of these bits and you pile the energy back up and there's the carrier right there. Not that hard to detect. And he points out that the channel could have carried, this was just, a, this was just the, 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 there was no modulation except for the code that was encoding the carrier. But you could have stuffed a 42 bit message in there, which is seven characters and you would have been able to 70% probable decode it over a 7,000 kilometer path between here and Italy or at least the East Coast in, in Italy. I can't show you a spectrogram because the signal is totally invisible. If you don't decode it, it is, it, is, it, is, it is spread out in frequency and it's just in the noise. You would never, ever, ever know it's there. At VLF, by the way, a very strong signal is 40 dB below the noise floor. So you need this coding. You just won't be able to tell it's there. But if you do it right, the trouble is you need to know when to start decoding and stop decoding and how fast the BODs are. So someone has to tell you beforehand when you're starting, what this, the time is between BOD transitions and how long you're going and what the frequency is. If you know that, you can, get, you can set up the decoding. You can't really figure it out because you can't detect the signal. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sure, I, I, there are, I'm sure people are beginning to, to, to do this. Yeah, this is... Right, right. Again, you have to first pile up the energy that you've, I mean, a code is a way to take energy and spread it out over a bunch of frequencies, but as you know, it's deterministic. So then later on, you know what the code was and you can pile it back up. Yeah, yeah. And this is spread spectrum, 200,000 units in the code are not uncommon. So this is really, really long codes, um, but you can see that it's possible. A lot of this software is open source. If you like Unix software, it's written as little utilities that do one thing and then put the, then write it to a file or put it like on a socket where you can read it. Um, so it's all open source. You can compile it and run it yourself. Uh, they're called VLF RX tools. You can find it on the, the net. You know, you feed the audio into a sound card. Um, there's a power line hum filter. You can triangulate with more than one axis if you have them. It will actually look for Whistler and Chorus events and detect them and save them for you. It will also uh, try to, again, triangulate the outlightling location. And you can also look at the bearing and distance. Like it will try to figure out where NAA is propagating to you if you were in the middle of the country. I think it gets a little difficult as you get closer to Maine. Um, and uh, it just goes on and on. It, and it will run on a Raspberry Pi. It's very, very low weight. Um, and so finally, he just left some websites here where you can poke around and learn more about this. Um, so there you go, natural stuff, man-made stuff. But once again, it's like when this, it's like when the amateur service, right, got licensed. I mean, Bob W1XP was doing experimental transmissions, right, at 400, at 630 meters and also 2200 meters. And that then the AWRL basically got a frequency allocation. So now if you're an amateur, you can transmit on 473 kilohertz, I think, which is just below the AM broadcast band, that's 630. And you can transmit on 100, I think 34, which is 2200 meters. This is just the very low frequency extension of the fact that there are these bands that people can use for experimental stuff. And, you know, there's a lot of challenges in doing it, but, but cool stuff is what you end up receiving. There you go. Does anybody uh, anybody have any questions either in the room or online that I didn't cover while we were going? Let me uh, come out of this. Right. Yes. You were talking before about how other planets 
have magnetic fields and these these effects in there. Mm -hmm. is, is were they detect you said somebody det detected pardon me I'm a little bit hoarse here you said somebody else had already detected them were they detecting them from here or from satellites satellite okay so there's no such thing as or is there such a thing as radio astronomy using very low frequency oh no there there is the the uh so let me just let me let me okay so so first of all people have flown wave instruments on pretty much every planetary mission right since they started flying stuff okay so as you get closer to the planet um they have a wave instrument it's a plasma wave instrument it, like that van allen probe stuff that i played for you it's got electric antennas and magnetic antennas and by receiving the plasma waves you again can back out information about the plasma environment and the University of Iowa and a guy named Don Gurnett, who just passed um, this past year, was the king of this. You can find thousands of recordings that Don made of emissions in Jupiter and Saturn and most planets that have a, a reasonably strong magnetic field. Um, so that's flying on the spacecraft, okay? But there are people that do VLF recordings from the ground. Now, whether you're doing, you, it's a little hard to do radio astronomy with that. Um, but not necessarily impossible. The trouble is you have to have a radio astronomy source that's transmitting at those very low frequencies. And typically that doesn't get out of the magnetic field of the star. So if you were to go close to the star, you could start hearing these things. But from here, it's a little hard for you to get out of the plasma bubble around the star and have them make their way here. As I remember, uh, the, the resonant frequency of the earth is something like seven Hertz. Right, that's those Schumann resonances I talked about. Yes, I was just wondering if you couldn't detect other planets by checking for um, um, low frequency I, emissions. To the extent that we know something about the ionosphere of other planets, and we know something about some of the ionospheres, you can start figuring out what the waveguide size is, and you might be able to receive those. I, I am not as not familiar. I'm not as familiar with that literature, but I will look that up. Oh, I think there's a question on the other side, and. By the way, after that, if anybody online has a question, I'll take it. So go ahead. Uh, you said that uh, these are usually fairly stable. Um, Pass. Are you looking at uh, any changes over time, especially with all the stuff that's going on with global warming right now? Oh, okay. So um, the question is, uh, you know, paths at VLF are stable. Are we looking at anything having to do with, you know, gradual atmospheric change due to anthropogenic effects? Um, the stable paths are usually on, you know, I think minutes to a couple of hours. Okay. On a very, on a longer time scale, like you're talking about, you know, years, um, people are looking at the upper atmosphere is a fairly sensitive detector of, you know, secular change, change over years. My colleagues, not using VLF, but using higher frequencies, you can very clearly see a temperature trend in the upper atmosphere. The interesting thing about the temperature trend is that the upper atmosphere is cooling because the way the temperature structure of the atmosphere goes is that if the bottom is getting hotter, then there's a layer that's cooling, there's another layer that's heating, and then there's another layer that's cooling, and that has to do with the wave activity at these various levels. But it's definitely cooling. And the strange thing is that it's, uh, it's cooling at a pretty good rate, almost faster than CO2 alone. So there's something wrong with our models about how the thermal processes are going, but it, there's no question that it is changing. There's a fairly large anthropogenic signal there, um, if you can measure temperature by some by some means. Is there, is there any, I see there was any relation between that in particulate? Oh, okay. So in other words, particulate emissions, for example. Yeah, um, so the question is, has anybody looked at the difference between that and particulate emissions? What's really going on now, if you go to a conference, is um, whole atmosphere coupling. It used to be that the lower atmosphere people would have meetings and the upper atmosphere people would have meetings and they wouldn't necessarily ever be in the same room because to the lower atmosphere, the upper atmosphere is a boundary condition, okay? And to the upper atmosphere, the lower atmosphere was a boundary condition. It turns out waves punch right through that boundary. And uh, one of my colleagues at Haystack has shown that uh, gravity, atmospheric gravity wave activity, not the gravity waves that you hear from like the LIGO interferometer, they're going when two black holes collide. These are just wind blows over a mountain. And so you get a little bit of the, the air gets lifted up in a little column. 
as you go up in altitude, the density is falling off. So that wave gets larger and larger and larger. It's, it's like waves coming up on a beach, right? As the shore gets shallower, the wave gets bigger and bigger. And what happens in a beach, eventually the, the water can't hold the wave. And so it turns over and you get turbulence. The turbulence is where all the sand is moving, right? Because you've got energy transfer there. Same thing happens in the, in the atmosphere. The way the, the wind blows over a mountain, it, by the time it gets up to the mesosphere, about 85 or 90 kilometers, the wave is too big and it turns over. Turbulence. Another set of waves gets generated. It goes up about 20 kilometers. Turbulence again. And a third set of wave gets generated and those go up into the ionosphere. So in general, lower atmosphere events get associated with upper atmosphere wave activity. But we're still trying to figure out the details of how all of these, these energy transfers change. But there's no doubt that when we have, when you see on the news that the jet stream has moved, right? Okay, the polar vortex has broken up. It's going to be, you know, a colder than usual winter. There are signatures up in the ionosphere that 15 years ago, if you had gone to a conference and put them up, they would have canceled your paper. They would say, nah, that can't possibly happen. The challenge for the community is that means you got to model everything. Your model has to start at the ground and go all the way out because of this inconvenient physics facts that the charged particles are stuck to the magnetic field lines and they're very long. Yeah, and then there's that, which, which he's mentioning quasi-linear, which is just a way to model this stuff that means that I can handle the equations. Unfortunately, nature is all nonlinear, so all, most of that is not right. And now I have to duck because if one of the people I know who does quasi-linear diffusion is listening to this, I'm very sorry, but that's true. Um, uh, we're doing some work on nonlinear acceleration, in fact. And, and it, it, the point is, nature is 99% of the nature is the part that you can't solve, that you really need a computer to deal with. But you know, you have to get you have to get through some things to understand this in school. Anyways, um, yeah, no, I mean, it's whole atmosphere is the subject of almost everything now. The communities are beginning to talk to one another, beginning, but it's a lot to learn at once. You got to learn now this part and that part and connect them together. So uh, in terms of climate change, yeah, you got to look at the whole system. It's very complicated. Any questions out there? Oh, there's some things in the chat, but I, hopefully they're just, don't forget to subscribe. <laughs> so Jim Pine point out, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel, everybody out there. Um, all right. So with that, if there's any other business, does anyone else have any other business that they'd like to bring up? All right, hearing none. If I had a gavel, I would declare the Envark May meeting closed. Thanks everybody for being here. And I hope that you found some of that interesting and stay tuned for announcements about field day. And let's see, the June meeting will occur slightly before field day, right? It's usually like a week or so before, something like that. If I, I don't have my mental calendar right, but I think it's something like that. Um, yeah, Bill is asking if that's the last meeting of the year. I don't entirely know. I don't have we I'm not sure if we've discussed here whether we're having meetings in the summer in July and August other than the picnic. Traditionally, there's been the picnic, but I don't know that there's been a monthly meeting in July and August, and they tend to pick up in September. So unless you hear otherwise, that's what we might do. But I'll I'll ping Bruce to try to see if we can make that clear. Okay. See y'all. Thank you, Phil. You bet. My very pleasure. Very interesting. Very interesting. Very much so.